All right, so let me just jump to the next topic that, um, even, yeah, so suppose Jax can run for you and then we get some output from there. And an important aspect of doing Gibbs sampler or like Markov chain Monte Carlo in general is that we have to make sure that the MCMC does converge to the posterior, right? So far I've been talking about, well, you just run, need to run it long enough and they will approximate, et cetera, et cetera. But there exist some diagnostics out there that can help you to check if convergency is achieved or not. And then if it's not, what are the solutions you have to make it happen? Okay, so this is what I want to talk about in this particular part called MCMC diagnostics. All right. So if a Gibbs sampler iterates enough times, the draw will be from the joint posterior distribution. And that distribution, in the theory, is typically called the target or stationary distribution. Okay, we don't go into detail here, but we need to run the Gibbs sampler long enough so eventually the draws will be from the target or stationary distribution. Earlier, I, we already sort of touched upon this. And my question, say, for one is, do you think the initial values matter? We kind of saw it not really, right? When we try the initial value for mu and the initial value for phi, both of them for one, we eventually see the same summary, very close summary of mu, okay? So actually, they wouldn't matter, and we're gonna see how to, to, how to make that work, okay? Another point here is we talked about Markov chain last time a little bit, and so MCMC, the first MC stands for Markov chain. And we were doing this iteratively, meaning that the next draw, like say the draw of the next iteration of mu, gonna depend on the previous draw of mu, right? So that creates dependency between the draws. And then eventually we want independent draws to summarize because the second MC in MCMC is multi -colo. Okay, so eventually we need to summarize independent draws so we have to figure out how to create independent draws, okay? And another natural question I'm sure you might be asking is how long we should be running this, okay? You don't want to run it forever. So far, the model that we are working with right now is pretty simple, so it can run pretty fast. But a lot of times when the model gets complicated, you probably don't have the resources to run that fast, uh, run that like um, long or that far, but Ultimately, as long as we run it long enough and it adequately explore the posterior distribution, we can stop, okay? So it's, it's not that, oh, I have a lot of computation resources, I just want to run it forever. You don't want to do that, and we are talking about now how to evaluate whether you need to run it longer or not. And then, of course, can any kind of diagnostics can tell us whether the chain is not converging or not, okay? So these are the key questions I have or people have. All right, so the first stuff that I want to talk about is the initial values. So just now when I did uh, the demo with uh, initializing the Gibbs sampler with mu and with phi separately and then show the results in the end, I was summarizing the entire chain, right? I, I was doing like for 10,000 iterations and then I summarized the mu from the old para and then the new para. And then I see that the results are pretty similar. The thing is, uh, the model that we're working with, like I said, uh, is pretty simple. So the, like the, the, the convergence actually was achieved pretty early on and then everything was fine. But typically, when you have real, like actual, like complicated models that you're working with, we need to uh, discard the initial values because we don't want the initial values to affect the posterior too much, okay? Say for example, if you start mu with 10, and then in another, in another round, you start the mu with 100, et cetera, et cetera. So the model, of course, gonna explore values around 10, for example, for the first try, and it's gonna have values around 100 at the beginning, right? But eventually, mu is gonna converge to what the posterior distribution should be. So we don't want the pre-convergence values to influence the summary. So we actually gonna try to um, get rid of them. So typically, as you can see, uh, even though it's hard to know exactly when the convergence happened, but it's very typical or standard to throw out the first certain percent of draws. Okay? Typically, default is 50%, and we call this period as burning, meaning that we run the chain, run the Gibbs sampler for a certain number of times, like iterations, 
but we want to get the first 50% we discard them, so they won't affect the ultimate summary of the posterior. We call them burn in. And then, of course, once you do the burn in, the inference should be done with the remaining balls. Okay, so, this idea again, because you start the chain maybe at some values that is not really around the posterior, but if you discard them and then summarize the remaining balls, then you will still have a good approximation to the actual posterior. We call it burn in. So, the term actually shows up in the JAX code. So again, I understand we are not able to try it today, but remember earlier I was talking about those inputs here. Yeah. So in JAX, burn in, it just called burn in. Okay. And you just tell JAX how many iterations you want to run for the burning period. Okay. So for the demo right now, I'm not doing 50%. I'm just like talking about it generically. Usually the default is 50. Okay. And for this case, we do a burning of 2,000 draws. And we actually sample, we use uh, 5,000 draws to summarize the posterior. Okay, so this is what this 2,000, was our 2,000 and 5,000 means. And this adapt, I think, is something specific to the JAX package that they use. So it's, it's not the same as burn in, even though it's unclear, I think, exactly what it is. But people do like run like a couple of thousand at the, at the beginning. And then you fit in a burning period, and then you only sample for a fixed number of iterations. Okay? So I just want to show you that JAX can allow you to choose the burning period, how many iterations I want for the burn in. Okay? And in fact, if you think about what we just did earlier, without the JAX, just code it yourself, in the end we have like 10,000 draws of mu and phi, right? What you can do is I just chop off the first 50% of the draws. And that will be how you can manually do this diagnostics when you try to do the burning period. Okay? But JAX is pretty flexible. It allows you to choose the number of iterations that you want for each part. Okay? So the demo now is... I do a thousand iterations for adapt. Don't worry too much about what it is. To be honest, I don't really know what it is, but it's just a standard practice. I want to fix it so later we know how many there are. Okay, and then burn in is two thousand, and then I actually so this is after adapt and burning. I'm running this give sample for five thousand iterations, and the results that we can summarize from that is based on this five thousand balls. Okay, All right. So good. We uh, it's important to discard the initial values uh, because you don't want them to influence the summary, and we call this process burn in. Another thing about MCMC diagnostics is, well, you do want to have really good um, mixing of the chain. So let me talk to you a little bit about the definition here. So imagine that you start the chain, say in our case we have mu and v. Right? We're drawing them iteratively, and then if we're only looking at them separately, now like one individually, I should say, then we're going to get like a draws of mu and then draws of phi. And then like what we're saying, we want the draws of mu to approximate, so the draws to approximate the posterior. And if we are able to plot the draws in some way, because they're indexed by time or indexed by iteration, Right? We want the draws of the mu to adequately uh, explore and approximate the posterior. So one way that we can see how it is doing in terms of exploring the posterior area is doing something called trace plot. I'm going to show you a couple of plots in a minute. But overall, it's showing the progress of the chain over time, over time meaning over iterations. Okay? So the ideal trace plot should have a lot of movement like going back and like up and down, up and down, fully exploring the parameter space. Whereas if you have something not mixing too well, you're going to see a lot of stick stickiness in the chain. Meaning that like, well, my chain, like my chain is very sticky, meaning that my observations or my draws are very similar to each other. Okay, but we don't want it. Okay, and trace plot definitely, if it has a train, like keep going up or keep going down, 
then that means that actually gives you evidence that the MCMC sampler has not yet converged. Okay. And you probably want to run it longer, or maybe there's an error in the code. And um, let me just show you a couple of examples so you know what I'm talking about. So this is output from JAX uh, using the CE uh, example. I'm plotting. So there are four plots, so usually if you try to plot it, but the upper left is the trace plot, okay? the trace plot for mu. Okay? So one thing I want you to pay attention to, and that's why earlier I was talking about how many iterations for adapt for burn in, and then for, for sample is looking at uh, index here. So I was saying um, JAX typically has a depth period and then a burning period that you can play with, and then of course the sample period that you decide, right? So earlier what we had, we have a depth to be a thousand, right? And then burn in. There's 2,000 and sample to be 5,000, right? And I said that the adapt and the burning going to be discarded. So that's why when you are sorry when you are summarizing anything over here, especially from the trace plot, as you can see, we're summarizing from the 3,000 to the 8,000, okay? Because that's the number of period that I'm doing the sample part. So that's why, that's how this index is working. So that's why earlier I want to fix the adapt so we know what we're doing. Okay, all right. So this, as you can see, is just plotting. We call it trace plot. It's just plotting the draws across time. Okay? So this, if you look at the y scale, it's trying to explore. I think it's pretty much converging to to the posterior in the end, and then you're seeing the bouncing back and forth or up and down of the trace plot, you don't really see any kind of stickiness. So for example, what would be a sticky trace plot? You might have, well, I started the chain here and then I start to have things like this. Okay. So this will be examples of sticky, okay? Whereas if you already converge to the posterior, sorry, posterior, just like what we see over here. Okay, of course, I mean, the range might change. In this case, they're pretty much just zoom in for this part. This is also, I mean, another reason why I said earlier that the model is simple enough that it goes to the posterior pretty quickly and then just like explore this pretty well. Okay, whereas sometimes you might see stickiness is what I'm drawing over here. And then after a while, finally start to converge to the posterior and then you go back and forth over here, okay? I should also mention the uh, trace plot over here that we're showing is not plotting the adapt period and the burning period, right? So I'm sure if it's also plotting that, then the beginning periods, maybe it's starting from here, I don't know exactly. Oh, I should know, because we start mu with one, right? So one is down here, for example. So I think the chain started over there but it goes there pretty quickly. Okay, yeah. But from JAX, as soon as you like plot the parameter, and then they're gonna give you a trace plot, a trace plot that doesn't show any kind of stickiness, does not, in, like does indicate that there shouldn't be like a convergence issue. Okay, so trace plot is useful for doing that. All right, and there are many other draws here. I mean, another plot here. The next one we're gonna focus is the bottom right, which is called the autocorrelation plots, okay? So autocorrelation, ACS, from the name, as you can see, is just looking at the correlation of yourself. And here, we're talking about yourself is more about, because we're looking at the same parameter, okay? If you look across time of parameter mu, then the autocorrelation of mu it's just the correlation between the draws of mu across time. Okay? So plotting that can help us to evaluate whether those draws are independent or not. Okay? So Markov chain, uh, sorry, Monte Carlo draws are independent, so they will have zero autocorrelations for sure. Whereas dependent draws, which is MCMC, because we have Markov chain property here, they're gonna have non-zero, usually positive correlations 
of autocorrelation. If you're going to have large autocorrelations, it's going to indicate that the chain is not mixing well, and you probably have to run it longer. Also, when you have a lot of parameters in your model, that large autocorrelations often arise. Okay. Typically, this means that you need to run the chains a little bit longer to feel more comfortable. And another way to look at this is the effective sample size, which I will talk about as well. But we already saw it in the output earlier. So as an ACF class example, so I was saying, is this plot bottom right? It might be a little bit hard to read, but what it's trying to plot is the autocorrelation on the y-axis and then the lag on the x-axis. Okay, so the lag is just like one lag is like s and s plus one, two lag is s and s plus two, it's just like how many lags in between the draws. Okay, so this is saying what? You have a one autocorrelation with yourself at the same time point, which totally makes sense, right? Because it's you and yourself at the same iteration but it quickly drops down to close to zero in the next lag. Okay. A plot like this, uh, autocorrelation, ACF plot like this, meaning that there are very little autocorrelation between the draws, which means good mixing. Okay, so again, I'm trying to emphasize that the model is simple, so we, we are seeing this kind of results. And then you might be wondering, okay, what will be a bad uh, autocorrelation plot? I shouldn't say bad, well, uh, autocorrelation plot that is showing you that there are high autocorrelations. So we're still going to have the lag on the uh, x axis. So let's say one, uh, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-one, uh, twenty-five, for example. Yeah. So we know that. So as uh, this is zero. This is one. So autocorrelation at like one is always one, right? We talked about it. This is you and yourself. And then sometimes when you have a highly correlated um, draws in your deep sampler, you're gonna see something like this. Okay, so that would be indicating that your autocorrelation is still pretty high even after lag 20. Okay? Yeah. So that was just an example. Sometimes when the model is complicated, you will be able to see something like that. Okay? Maybe sometimes uh, it's going down more quickly. Maybe it goes down close to, <coughs> close to um, zero at lag 5. But anyway, this is actually pretty important to reading the lag because as you can see that if the autocorrelation is still really high between like zero and like 20, or like say, I should say not still very high in this case, it's almost zero between like zero and like 20, that is actually a indicating factor. And you will see like a way to get rid of the autocorrelation is instead of using all of the draws that I have, I'm only using every other 20 draws. Okay, because when you see this example, like zero and like one, um, like, like zero and like one is pretty high as you can see, but then like zero and uh, like 20 almost gets to zero. So that indicates that if I delete all of the in-between draws, the autocorrelation gonna goes to zero, right? So that will be later, you will see like a way, okay, if I'm gonna get a really bad ACF plot and I can read it from ACF plot that, how far I should go then that actually gives you an indicator of how you can um, save, like say, in this case, save every other 20 draws, so then at the end of the day, I'm still going to get independent draws. Okay? All right. So another way to look at this is what we call effective sample size. So this, again, is related to autocorrelation. It's this particular column in the output of the... Um, Jack's output. So here it's 5,000. So remember, we, we run it for 5,000 iterations. Okay. So effective sample size, you can think of this as because MCMC draws are like dependent from each other, right? And then you are able to compute something called effective sample size. And that number is telling you 
say we start with 5,000 MCMC iterations, right? That's what we have. And then the effective sample size, that number is telling you that 5,000 MCMC draws equals to how many independent samples. So this is telling us it's 5,000, meaning that it's very, very little autocorrelation. You can use all of them. So you can use this column, SSEFF, and the ACF plots together to determine if you want to run the chain longer, or I should save every other certain number of draws. Okay. So let me show you what you can do if you do find something pretty bad. Not in our case, but if you do find <coughs> highly dependent samples, you can use something in the JEX, which is called theme, to make that work. So that comes into here. I probably didn't notice, it's okay. It's the last input that you have over here. So in the demo, as well as even now, like we run all of this, check the plots, and then check also the effective sample size, we realize we don't really need to do anything because they are very highly not correlated. Okay? But if you see something, earlier I was talking about, well, if you see your ACF plot and you see the lag 20, Finally, at that point, it goes close to zero, then that is the number that you should fit in for the thing. Okay? And that's talking about I'm saving every other 20 draws. Okay? So this obviously creates an issue if you think about it, because I cannot use like the in-between 20 draws, right? So in order to have the same number of draws I'm going to summarize, I have to run the chain much longer, right? And then save whatever I have. And I need to save independent draws. So if you're going to do it like by hand, you just like have to, I mean, by hand, meaning I code up your deep center itself, and then you have to run it super long, and then you write, I typically write a loop and then save every other like 20 draws, and then in the end I have the final draws. But what's so nice about Jax is that, okay, I'm doing thing as one at the moment, right? And I get adapt, I get burn in, and I get sample. And I have 5,000. So in the end, it's summarizing based on this 5,000 draws. Okay? I should mention that, for example, if we're going to get thing to be 20, let's just say, as an example. Okay? When you run this, it's going to be much longer than what you would have when thing is one. Because essentially, JAX is following exactly what you're saying here. They just consider, like they incorporate the thinning in between, right? So I said that I want 5,000 samples in the end. That's all I want. So if you set thin to be 20, it's going to round that 5,000 times 20 for you and then only save every other 20. So that's one thing I like about Jax that, well, it's very automatic that whatever you need to do, just tell it and then you're going to do it for you. In the past, when I was learning all of this uh, for the first time, I was writing like, all of the code myself and I have to save everything. It's pretty tedious. Yeah. But Jax, I think, is pretty uh, flexible in that. Okay. So that's uh, for the theme. And then, of course, uh, for the mu, as you can see down here, that's what um, the uh, MCMC diagnostics that we have for, for mu. And then if you're curious about phi, that's what it looks like. And the autocorrelation is super low as well. Okay. All right. I think I'm going to uh, stop here. We just have one more. Um, yeah, we're going to stop here. But I'm just saying that we just have one more diagnostic, which um, we're going to talk about, I think, on Tuesday, because Thursday is going to be the exam. And um, so I was in an email later today about the scope. I'm going to include some of the MCMC stuff that we talked about for, for the exam. And the homework is due uh, tomorrow at 5. I have office hours today and then tomorrow if you want to stop by. And solutions will be posted right after it's due. So you can check that. With, uh, with, with, but you have to submit yours. But anyway, you have solutions to check. All right.